Hello, welcome to High School Physics. And uh, today we're going to be looking at pressure and we're going to start some of the work on thermal physics. So um, let's dive in. Here we go. So today we hope to understand pressure in solids and fluids, states of matter. That, that just means if something's a solid, a liquid or a gas, evaporation, pressure changes of a gas. Okay, so quite a bit of work, but um, pretty straightforward. Let's dive in and find out what is in store for us. So a quick change of these screens. Here we go. Right. First of all, pressure. <clears throat> pressure in solids and pressure in fluids. Now, the word fluid, you know what that is, right? But in physics, fluid means a gas or a liquid. And that's why we chose it. Okay, it means a gas or a liquid. Solids is solids. There's no other little thing going on there. Now look, the pressure in a solid, you guys know this. If you're using something, like you've got hold of grandma's fork for carving up some meat or something, okay, then the pointy end, all right, the business end, when you're gonna dunk something, all right, it's got a high pressure because it's got a small area, because it's pointed. The handle, you don't want high pressure on the handle, large surface area, therefore easy to hold on to. The bit you want to stick into the meat, nice and pointy, okay? So there you go, thanks grandma, that was worth getting hold of. All things which rely on pressure, okay, corkscrew, Pointy end for going into the cork. Okay, nice big handles. So we get less pressure here. So the pressure is to do with area. Okay, and these lovely tongs. Okay, came off an, came off an aircraft, I believe. Well, I know they did guys. Okay, so um, these are ice tongs and nice sharp edges here. Okay, so they can hang onto the ice nice broad handles so not much pressure on your hands okay there we go all right we can dig out loads of things with pressure usually things with with a pointy end that's my rowdy neighbors things with a pointy end guys all right if we were to study history there's loads of pointy ends in history the pointy end of a bullet means it can go in something all right so whenever we reduce the surface area we we are trying to increase the pressure all right, and um, if you've got something like a bayonet, this is a 19th century Japanese bayonet, then when the edge is sharpened along here, when that blade is sharpened, we're reducing, we're reducing the area, and therefore, as the area is being reduced, the pressure is being increased. Pointy end for frightening people away, nice sharp end for cutting your bread in the morning because no one's remembered to bring a knife to war with them. I know it's terrible, isn't it? Okay, so that's it guys. We could spend a lot of time looking at lots and lots and lots of things to see what happens with pressure, but it's nice and easy because the pressure in a solid is going to be equal to the force over the area. That's it, okay? Force is in Newton's area. Well, it should be meter squared because we're doing SI units, all right? So the units are newtons per meter squared, and that's known as a Pascal, named after the geezer who wrote it all down to start with. Okay, a Pascal. Pretty straightforward, isn't it, guys? All right, I just seem to have dropped a piece of my bayonet on the floor, the scabbard. Let's, let's put that away before something dreadful happens. Right. So, I knew that would come in use eventually. Right guys, fluids, slightly different. Um, the pressure in a fluid is equal to rho g h, all right? G is gravity, rho is, you've discussed this before, but you may not have realized that, rho is a Greek letter, okay? And it's drawn like that. All right, and it means density. So the pressure is equal to 
density times gravity times the height of the liquid. And remember, height could also be depth. Okay, so you may see this written as rho g d. But you see, d could confuse people with density. So we tend to call it height rather than depth. Okay, that's the plan. Also measured in Pascals, Newtons per meter squared. All right, and if you checked all the units on this, it would come out the same once you cancel them down. All pretty straightforward? Good, excellent. What's under here? Well, under here, guys, is our barometer. Now, a barometer is used to measure pressure. There's different types of barometer. There's something called an aneroid barometer, which has got a little box, which is quite spongy, like a corrugated metal box. It's about that big. And that box is pushed in and out when the air pressure changes. But on our Cambridge syllabus, which we are vaguely following, okay, they say you should know about a mercury barometer. Now, the easiest way of doing this is to have a quick look at Google, all right? But basically how it works is this. We get a tube, which is about a meter long, give or take, all right? So you get a nice long tube and it, it's about 90 centimeters long, usually, okay? We fill it up with mercury. Now, don't do this at home, guys. We fill it up with mercury. Mercury is the most toxic metal known to us, which is not radioactive. It's very, very poisonous. And then we take our tube and we get a little dish like this, which also has mercury in it. Okay. And we get our tube and we turn it upside down. So around it goes into here and the top is there. So I'm going to put a T here, that's going to go to the top. That goes up here to the top. There, okay, so that becomes the top of the tube. The mercury goes, sinks down inside like that. And there's a vacuum in the top there. All right, so there's a vacuum. And what we end up with is a column of mercury. There. That's it. Guys, we don't even need to look on the, on the interweb for that one. All right. The top has a vacuum. Why is there not a Q in vacuum? I don't got no idea. Sounds like vacuum to me. All right. So we get our mercury, put it in a tube, nice strong tube, flick it upside down, put it into a little bowl of mercury, and the whole thing comes to rest. The whole thing stabilizes out with about... 760 millimeters of mercury here, about 760 millimeters of mercury, okay? And what's happening, guys, is that the air pressure is pushing down here, and that forces the mercury up, okay? So the air pressure is pushing down and that forces the mercury up, all right? When it's a higher air pressure, the mercury will creep up the tube. Okay, so when there's a higher air pressure, the mercury goes up higher and there's a change in the length. All right, so if it's higher, we can see that with the length of the mercury. That's it. Low pressure, less pressure down here means this mercury sinks. And so what happens is the mercury pressure is equal to rho GH. Mercury is very dense. G is 10, give or take. And therefore our height is that because mercury is so dense. It's very, very dense material, right? Now that's going to be equal to the atmospheric pressure. Now the atmosphere is not very dense, about 1.3 kilograms per meter cubed. All right, G is the same. And the height of the atmosphere, well, that's, that's debatable because the atmosphere doesn't stop suddenly. It doesn't just like end like the ocean, like one minute you're dry, the next minute you're wet. With the atmosphere, the height, is a little bit debatable, but you know, we're looking at over a hundred kilometers. All right, so that's the height of the atmosphere. And of course, guys, the density of the atmosphere is not regular, all right? The higher you get, the thinner the air gets. So uh, difficult to apply this unless you've got averages. And in an exam question, you would get averages, 
all right? They give you numbers to deal with. So that's it. If you need to check it out, I had a little look on the interweb and there are thousands of pictures of this, all right? Take the mercury, turn it upside down, rest it into a little tray of mercury, and there it is. This is called a tortillion vacuum. Torsillion, sorry, torsillion vacuum. Um, they got the geezer who's, who first came up with this idea, all right? Which was quite a while ago. Good bit of history. Right, what's under this one here? Well, under here we've got a manometer. So, um, looks like manometer, right? Manometer, something for measuring men, all right? But it's pronounced manometer, manometer. And it's a posh word, guys, for YouTube. So, we just, not the type, no, no, not the YouTube, not that one, guys. No, the original YouTube. Yeah, there was an original one, yeah? Which was an, a tube which was shaped like a U. I know, who would have thought? Yeah, okay. So we had a YouTube like that. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't look quite as interesting as a new one. And what we do is we put a liquid in here and then we have one end open to the atmosphere. And this end here, we put a tube on it, like a rubber tube. And that will go, say, to a gas supply. So we've got a gas supply and the gas is pushing in here. So the gas supply is creating the pressure here. Okay, now inside here is a liquid and the liquid gets pushed down on this side and it goes up on this side. So our liquids in the, in the U-tube, all right? Fortunately, we call it a manometer so we don't get confused with the other U-tube because you can see it's remarkably similar to the other one, all right? And then what happens is this, guys, the pressure on here is the atmospheric pressure. So the atmosphere pushes down here. The height of this liquid also pushes down here. So to start with, it was balanced. And so this extra pressure comes from the gas supply, which pushes down on here. Okay. So this height of the liquid, this height of liquid over here means we can find the pressure because the pressure equals rho g h we can measure the height ka-ching the money's in the bank we know gravity 10 is what we pretend it is for our course and the density well if we put water in here which we can do we know the density is um a thousand kilograms per meter cubed all right so make sure we use si units we know that we can work out the pressure on the gas that's important if someone's supplying gas to your house you need to be able to measure the gas pressure to make sure you're not getting too much pressure in the pipes or too little so nice little way of measuring pressure manometer not manometer not a barometer barometer good excellent let's move ahead what's next on our little list is states of matter Okay, states of matter, guys. Solids, liquids, and gases, right? Very quickly, let's not hang around with this. Let's fold this lovely piece of brown paper, okay? Guys, solids, all right? In a solid, our particles tend to be, if you think about marbles in a tray, right? If these were marbles, they would all be, if we rolled them into the tray, they would all fill up the tray in a nice uniform manner like this, okay? That would be our solid, right? Just the marbles would fill up the tray. Our liquid would slosh around in the tray. They would still pretty much like be in touch with each other, but they're not kind of regularly spaced around. Yeah, but a liquid would tend to stick together. You get a random bit over here where it's just sticking to the plastic tray. But if we pour our liquid into the tray, it moves around, okay? It takes up the shape of the tray, but um, our solid would maintain its shape. Right, so we put a brick into the tray, it'll stay as a brick. We put our water in the tray, it'll just take up the, the shape of the tray. And our gas, our molecules in the gas, just pinging them out all over the place. Random as guys, all right? So these are bonded together very strongly. These have fairly strong bonds, but there's some ability to move. These still move, but they oscillate around a fixed point. These ones move around. 
not as much as the gas and the gas has very loose bonds easy to move around fills up the whole container you know that guys all right so when there's a gas if there's a funny smell in the room all right somebody's walked into the room and there's a funny smell followed them in okay then you know that thing that smell permeates through the whole room because of diffusion and um the gas particles move around the room right what does the b stand for brownian motion brownian motion now this is physics guys but robert brown was a botanist okay and he was studying pollen grains and he's scottish and i was up there in scotland looking through his microscope and then he could see these little bits of pollen little bits of pollen under his microscope they were in water and these little bits of pollen were going bing, 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 bing. they were making a noise no just me bing, like this moving around and they went wow look at that pollen grain it's moving around it's going all the different ways it's got rapid it's got random motion he said wow those pollen grains have got rapid random motion and his name was Robert Brown, so we called it Brownian motion after the after the chap who was studying it. This is with a Victorian thing, okay? And what he figured out was this, guys. The pollen grains were massive, but they were being hit by the water molecules, and the water molecules were much, 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 much smaller than the particles, okay? That they were collided into. So what he said was. The water molecules, they're not moving in a convection current, they're just oscillating around. And when they hit the pollen, they make it move in these little directions, okay? So what he said was, and the same happens with gas, we can do the same with smoke, okay? We can look at this with smoke particles in a gas. The larger molecules get moved by the very, very fast moving smaller molecules. Okay, so the pollen grains are very large, but to move them, you hit them with a very fast moving smaller object. If this was a gas, you would look through into a smoke cell and you could see these beautiful silver goldy specks of smoke being moved around, not in a convection current, because that wouldn't be random. And it would be quite gentle, but you see these being jostled around like this. Okay, Brownian motion. Right. Any questions about that? So then he said, well, our gases are moving around all the time. And if our gases are moving around with this motion, this motion, then our gases are always having collisions. And if there are collisions, then what's going to happen is as they collide with something, there is a change in momentum. Okay, now a change in momentum creates a force. All right, momentum is mass times velocity. Okay, mass times velocity is momentum. When there's a change in momentum, there's a force associated with it. All right, um, don't try this later, but you've got a mass. If you were to walk along into a wall, then you would stop very, very quickly your momentum would change because your velocity would go to zero and it would hurt. Yes, because the force would go doink on your nose. All right. So you really do understand this. Yeah. You can get the idea that we've got the force from the change in momentum. The collisions cause the change in momentum. And therefore that force causes pressure. That's what gas pressure is. Okay. So the pressure is the force created from the change in momentum due to the collisions. The collisions were seen by Robert Brown back in the Victorian era. There we go, guys. We are doing so well. And last on our little old list today is evaporation. Now, guys, evaporation is, is not boiling. Yeah. Okay. Boiling water will boil at 100 degrees C. Okay. It will evaporate. Um, when it's above zero yeah when a puddle evaporates it doesn't boil away you, you can't put your feet in oh there's a puddle evaporating i'll put my feet in it it'll be nice and warm 
It's the same temperature as the surroundings, guide. guys. Evaporation is not boiling. Boiling's at 100, okay? Evaporation has all the, all the temperatures between zero and 100. So what's happening? Well, we've got our puddle, there it is, okay? And um, the molecules are escaping, doink. Okay, and off they go. Now, in order to escape, they need loads of kinetic energy because the force is trying to hold water together because water forms nice droplets, yeah? So what's gonna happen is this. We have our molecules and our molecules are gonna be zipping along and they're gonna have loads of kinetic energy, okay? So our molecules have got loads of kinetic energy, all right? They're going to escape from here. So the ones with the most kinetic energy, and you can write it like that or like that, okay? They escape because they've got enough energy to, to tear themselves away from the puddle, right? The most energetic ones leave, and as that energy is leaving the puddle, the temperature goes down. Now guys, you know this, all right? If you go swimming, and when you get out of the pool, if you don't dry yourself pretty quickly, you start to shiver. If the wind is blowing, you'll, you'll shiver more, all right? So you're losing energy. When the water evaporates off your body, it needs energy to do it. You've got to give those molecules kinetic energy to escape from your body, and that evaporation makes you cool down. So if you want to cool something down, right, whatever it is, if you've got some food or some drinks you want to keep cold, you put a, a wet towel over your objects and as the water evaporates it'll cool them down yeah you don't put your drinks in those in the water you don't put your drinks in a river or in a swimming pool because they just get to the same temperature as the water but even on a hot sunny day if you cover your food or your drinks with a wet towel as the water evaporates it'll cool it down yeah definitely works try it next time you're down the beach or whatever but, um to, or wherever you are, it doesn't matter where you are, put a damp cloth, an object, could be a t-shirt, over your drinks, it'll cool them down. Excellent. Okay, what else can we do here? Um, oh, you've got to remember, guys, with um, evaporation, what will speed it up? Think about drying your laundry, all right? You've been swimming, your towel's all wet. If you want to dry it out, you put it in a draft, in a breeze, that will help evaporation, okay? and you spread it out. You give it a nice large surface area. Okay. Now it's kind of logical, isn't it? So homework should be get out and have a swim, all right? And then you can check out this physics for yourselves. Evaporation, nice large surface area, and um, put it into a breeze. And if, it, if the air temperature is warmer, it'll evaporate quicker. Yes, you know these things, good. All right, last thing is uh, pressure changes. Have I written something down for pressure changes? Let's have a quick look. And um, huh. it looks like I haven't actually put it on here, but that's okay. We are going to squeeze it in to our little bit of paper here. And the pressure changes are this, guys. All right. Our pressure changes are quite simple. Pressure changes for a gas. All right. If we have a constant volume. So imagine we've got a gas, like in a, an aerosol container, yeah? The gas is in an aerosol container. If it's got a constant volume, all right? If we increase the temperature, if the temperature goes up, the pressure will go up. All right? At a constant volume, if the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up. That's why it's dangerous to put um, old containers on fires and things like that, all right? because the temperature goes up, the pressure will go up, and then it will split open. And, and it's always going to hit you in the face, isn't it? The piece of metal is going to, it's not going to just disappear off and hit a wall or something. So that's why um, the pressure increases in a container, because the container stays at a constant volume and the temperature goes up, okay? And finally, at a constant temperature, at a constant temperature, okay, if we took the volume 
and decreased it, then the pressure would go up. Okay, so this would be like get a bicycle pump, right? Put your finger over the end of it, squash the pump down. Yeah. Now the the volume of the gas inside the pump is going down, and the pressure goes up because it's harder to push it in. So bicycle pump, squash it down with your hand. Okay, you've got your thumb over the end, and then you know that the pressure is going to go up. That's it. It's easy, isn't it? Now, we can write this down in a nice little rule. Pressure times volume equals a constant. Okay. And so, um, with this one here, as the volume goes down, the pressure goes up. So, it's always going to be equal to a constant. So, if we look at the pressure to start within a gas and the volume to start within a gas, and then we change the pressure, then we can change the volume. All right. So what we can end up with is something like, who knows, like three times eight is going to be equal to, well, if the pressure drops down to two, what's this one going to be? Three eight to 24, two twelves are 24. It's as simple as that, guys. This is how we're going to be using this equation. All right. Nice little equation there. All right, and with this one, we've got another equation we can use, which isn't on our syllabus, doesn't do any harm to know it. P1, B1 over T1 equals P2, B2 over T2. But the catch is, is that this temperature has got to be in Kelvin, not degree C, okay? All right, and we may not have done the Kelvin scale yet. So that's why this is not on your syllabus, right? But it's just a little gem which you might need to use later. This is on the CIE syllabus. Right, okay, you lovely people. We're pretty much done there, yeah? So um, this topic's gonna to continue. We've got a bit more coming up if I quickly check my notes, okay? We've got a bit more coming up do with the thermal expansion and that's going to lead into specific heat capacity and melting and boiling and conduction convection and radiation it's all lined up over here guys all right so um i'll see you in another video we'll cover those things if you've got a question ask the person next to you i can't hear a word you're saying go and ask your mum all right uh or jot it down in the little uh, comment box and someone will come to your rescue okay so before I go, and um, I just wanted to check, guys, before I go, I just wanted to check that we've done everything and I was going to leave. And um, we just wanted to check these things. Pressure and thermal physics. Make sure we understand pressure in solids and fluids. Remember, a fluid is a liquid or a gas. OK, the states of matter we discussed, that's the solid liquids and gases. Evaporation. Yeah, remember to go for a swim and uh, check out that evaporation and then the pressure changes for a gas. Okay, we did cover all these things and um, thank you. All right, see you next time, guys. Goodbye.